Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, panel discussion. I'm Alex Evernoff. I'm Director of Advisory and Inclusion at Involve, and we're delighted to partner today with My Skin, My Story for a truly inspiring panel event on visibility, mentorship, and supporting women of color in business. So joining me today are three brilliant panelists. Satya Bala, Head of Global Data Go Governance at Chanel, and founder of My Skin, My Story, which uh, she'll introduce in a, min in a minute. Elizabeth Scarpelli, uh, joining us from New York, and she is Global Head of Enterprise Wide Functions Compliance at BNY Mellon, as well as Sarah Nelson, Head of Finance, based in London uh, for Sainsbury's. So let's just start, start with our questions, shall we? Uh, straight to the point. Uh, Safia, you're, you're the founder of My Skin, My Story, which is an online community for women of color. Can you tell us a bit more about what motivated you to start this initiative? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad to be here. Um, yeah, so I honestly feel like over the last few years, I had personally kind of been reflecting in terms of my um, community, the, the friends in my life, um, the co-workers that I'm most kind of connected with. And I had a lot of women of color who were in my inner circle and were the, the people I kind of trusted both personally and professionally. Um, and I was really finding that there wasn't a space where we could bring all of ourselves. Um, and I think, you know, I did not expect 2020 to be the year that it was because the, the idea for this started in 2019. Um, but I think this whole piece around intersectionality of as we experience life, we don't know whether things are about our gender or our race, because actually we're all of those things and many more things. Um, and I was just finding that uh, I had close female friendships with women of color, but we didn't really talk about our experiences in terms of what connected us, but also what was unique, because actually women of color are made up of so many individual experiences that you can't generalize. Um, so I was, you know, I have a bit of a can-do attitude. So I was like, I, I'm sure something like this exists. Um, I didn't quite find something that wasn't a corporate kind of network type of space, because I think we need a place to take that mask off sometimes that we feel we need to put on in work and other social situations. Um, so yeah, I was kind of like, look, let's start a grassroots community. I had a few collaborators who were so excited um, and we launched, you know, in June. And it's really about how do we have kind of deep, intimate and meaningful connections with women of color so we can connect and empower and elevate each other. But then also how do we amplify our stories, you know, the word story is in the name for a reason of my skin, my story of actually all those allies out there, how do we actually propel our stories and start to reclaim the narrative that perhaps um, others have placed on us. So, you know, driving representation, talking about, well, who are those amazing women of color in business, in entrepreneurship, in the arts, you know, let's actually um, share that outward, but then really focus inward in, in in our community and Sarah and I used to um, grace the halls of Sainsbury's together that's been a while ago but it's been a great chance to reconnect so Sarah has been one of my key supporters in my skin my story and it's really about that power of connection um, and you know I could talk about this forever but I'll stop <laughs> soon um, I think one thing that has felt so kind of emotionally satisfying is no one could expect 2020 was what it was. And let's be honest, it's kind of continuing now. We've been having conversations in our community about just all, all of the things we're seeing in the news. And actually these individuals who are kind of being triggered by these situations or not sure how to deal with d &I conversations at work, uh, this has been like a real solid place of comfort and connection and advice that I'm not sure what we would have all done if we didn't have that community. So very passionate about it. And I just want it to grow and really kind of help as many women out there as we can. It's so important uh, to actually have your, your support network around you, especially we've seen after this year. Uh, it's a, and obviously it's continuing in 2021, but I think it's the one thing that will we'll, you know, value the most, I, I think from, from past experience. Um, 
Thank you so much, Safia. Uh, now, Sarah, you have launch, launched sorry, a brilliant uh, Conversations with the CEO series that helped Sainsbury's cement a wider ethnicity development program. And you've acted as an advisor, as an, as an advisory, advis oh my God, sorry. <laughs> of course, this had to happen at the end of the day. My apologies. You've acted as an advisor to ethnicity employee networks throughout your career. So what advice would you have for women of color looking to engage their senior leadership teams and driving change within their organizations? Yeah, great question, Alice. And before I start, just wanted to, you know, give give props to Safia and, and my skin, my story as well, because I'm um, completely right. I and mean, we've worked together for a number of years in the past. And actually, one thing we haven't really talked about was, you know, the, the thing that unites us, you know, being women of colour and actually the, um, the lived experiences that we share in common as a result of that and how that impacts, you know, how we progress our careers or, or maybe not. And, and, you know, and it's something we've only really started tapping into. So that comfort and connection you get from the community is, is so powerful. So I just wanted to start off by saying that. Um, I think in, in answer to your question, Alex, I think the key thing is for anyone looking to start up this conversation is it's, you have to see it as a marathon rather than a sprint. You know, we're at a stage in the same schools now where we are having some really advanced conversations on, on race. And one of the things that I've been working on is actually looking at this program with our DNI team and HR teams around, let's talk about race and how do we make sure that we are comfortable having those really uncomfortable conversations around you know, how we lead and, and, you know, and how we progress ethnically diverse talent through our business. Um, but that's taken a long time. There's a lot of groundwork that's happened five years ago in order to get to that stage, you know, we could not start having this conversation off the back of Black Lives Matter. You know, the network um, at Sainsbury's that we have in place is something I co-founded with. And actually a few people from My Skin, My Story were part of the, those early days of our network at Sainsbury's called I and Me. And um, we started those conversations five years ago. And that really created the ground, the, you know, the, the foundations for us to really have the in-depth conversation that we are having now. It's allowed us to really build the relationships. I think anybody that's starting to have those conversations now needs to realise that there's some really good connections. You've got to build a network internally and sometimes externally. And actually being part of a community like my school, my story really helps with that because you can share ideas, um, um, challenges, you know, things that you know maybe not working so well. But also thinking about the fact that you can't do this on your own. So you've got to find allies, um, you know, that can help you to really drive that conversation because it's a lot of work. Um, and at some point you're going to feel like you're getting really frustrated um, and you want to kind of either stop, give up. So you've got to protect your energy at the same time and be quite strategic around, you know, how you drive those conversations forward. But for me, I really started by going straight to the top and working with the CEO, building a relationship with him when he joined three years ago and actually bringing him on board and helping him to understand and through that connection, we've been able to really drive the momentum, but it really does take time. So protect your energy and, and don't try and do everything yourself. You know, you can't have everything on all of you. Yeah, that's, that's actually really interesting because um, uh, just for a quick parenthesis, but like with, with Involve, uh, we've never seen as many clients coming to us uh, to actually roll out workshops and awareness trainings on, on race and ethnicity in the workplace, which before were, were actually not really considered. Um, and, and it was actually the triggered we were actually trying to have those conversations of saying, okay, but what are you considering everything else? It's great to have trainings, but what about actually listening to your employees? What about, what, what are you hearing from them? So Sarah, it does, it's a journey and, and absolutely doesn't change. It doesn't, doesn't happen from one day to, to the other. It's about bringing everyone together as well, bringing everyone uh, in the conversation. So thanks. Thanks so much, Sarah, for, for sharing your, your experience. Um, Elizabeth, uh, you recently wrote a piece in the uh, Hispanic Executive detailing your experiences as a non-traditional student and the value of mentorship on your own career. What would you say to organizations who are still hiring for what we call a culture fit 
And why the shift to a culture ad uh, is important to break barriers for uh, underrepresented groups. Yeah, so thanks so much, Alex. I'm really excited to be here. Um, and, you know, good afternoon, early evening for those of you. <laughs> Uh, abroad. Um, I'm sitting in Connecticut, although I work in New York. Um, I haven't been into New York City for almost a year, now, over a year now. So definitely uh, interesting. But, you know, to just first start, so, you know, I say I was, you know, a non-traditional student in the sense that, you know, I was working while going to school full time. So I was very lucky that this summer before starting college, um, I had an opportunity that came up at Citibank working in a call center. And who would have guessed that, you know, 30 years later, I'd still be in financial services, spending more than half my career at Citi, um, moving on to other roles. But I didn't have mentors uh, when I started. I didn't, I didn't have a network of people that I could go to. And, you know, that built over time. But, you know, when I think about culture fit, you know, and I know we're going to spend a lot of time talking about mentors and mentoring and who uses it and who doesn't. But, you know, I think about culture fit is, you know, more about like, how does an individual uh, conform or adapt to an organization? And there's always that risk that that culture fit mindset reinforces biases that exist. So we see managers who hire more of the same or in their own likeness, because that's always worked for them. I think you know, the shift to this culture ad mindset is important because we need to focus on gaining those experiences and elements that a person brings to an organization. You know, we have to be open to it and look for something different. So, you know, finding what individuals bring, new skill sets, new perspectives, new experiences in areas where we're lacking, um, because that's going to help evolve the culture, but also it's going to enhance and complement, you know, what's already there. So, you know, when I'm hiring, you know, I, I run a compliance function, but I look at people who may have had experience in audit or risk or, you know, who maybe didn't work in financial services, but they did project management and they have transferable skill sets that they can bring to a role. So, you know, my advice is always be open to the non-traditional out of the box candidate. They may not check all of those nine or 10 check marks that you're looking for, but they definitely bring something new and different. And, you know, I always say pedigree and education alone are not reflective of an individual's potential. So, you know, I didn't go to an Ivy League school. I went to an average local college because I was able to take night classes um, while I was working full time and they had online classes and that was convenient for me. Um, but I think that we have to just make sure that we're thinking about, you know, what is additive. I think that that's what's really important. You know, and, and one thing that I'll add is it has to, to Sarah's point earlier, you know, you have to have the support from coming from the top down and it has to be reinforced by leadership within an organization. You know, so at BMY Mellon, you know, we, we emphasize that their strength and diversity and our differences are what makes us stronger. So, you know, we need to lead in a way that includes everything and everyone, because that next idea can come from anywhere. Exactly. Inclusive leadership is incredibly important and having those conversations at the executive level and the board level, is just crucial uh, to bring them on board and, and make sure that they're supporting and not only supporting, advocating uh, for, for diverse talent. Um, brilliant. So actually you touched on it, Elizabeth, so thank you for that. Uh, but just in terms of, mentorship what uh in terms this is a general question um so what what would you say is the value of mentorship i know we have some different uh insights here and different opinions which I'll, we would love to hear about but why why do you think women uh of color should seek mentorship opportunities yeah so <laughs> in preparing for this you know i, I we, we hear all of the statistics Right, so just a couple of important ones. You know, women hold 24% of senior management roles. They make up 3% of Fortune 500 CEOs. Um, for women of color, the wage and leadership gap is, is wider. And some of the things that we also see is, you know, recruiting women increase financial performance. So I see mentorship as important but I see sponsorship as more important, a business imperative. 
you know, we need mentors and sponsors and we need them for different things at different times. Um, you know, so you need to figure out where do you need help? Seeking out mentors that have skill sets that you're looking to develop. They give you feedback, they give you tough love. I had a mentor who told me, if you don't want the tough love, call your mom, she thinks you're great. <laughs> Um, but, you know, working with a mentor helps you sharpen your tools in your toolkit or add new tools. And, you know, it, it gives you that opportunity for professional development, for networking. It, it gives you that increased visibility and access because, you know, you need mentorship to sometimes be known. Perception's reality and it matters what other people think or how they perceive you. And, you know, we may not like it. It may be frustrating but it matters and you know mentors are going to give you the feedback that you need to really progress your career um, but you know i touch on sponsorship only because i do feel that that needs to be promoted more and that's what really moves the needle you know and that sponsor is that person that advocates for you when you're in you know when you're not in the room and you know they're investing some of that capital in supporting you absolutely and sp sponsorship a lot of uh, times happens with uh, leaders immediate circles so that means that obviously the diversity isn't necessarily there uh, in terms of the talent that they have exposure to. So obviously they have to be more purposeful in the way that they sponsor uh, talent. So um, Sarah, would you like to, to uh, share your experience in terms of mentorship as well? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay? Because I hear my, my, my uh, sound isn't very clear. So. There's a little bit of like background noise, but otherwise we can hear you. Okay, let me know. I may after this question just try and rejoin and see if it's any better. Um, hopefully, you can hear me now. For me, I mean, I echo everything that Elizabeth has, has just said. It is so important. Um, you know, having that, especially sponsorship, is really key to make sure that you can progress. And I think there are studies out there that show that sponsorship and progression are kind of, you know, intrinsic, intrinsically linked. Um, without that sponsorship, um, you know, it's much more difficult to actually work your way through the levels of an organisation. And actually, as Elizabeth pointed out, naturally, um, people tend to sponsor those that are within their... Oh, that's too bad. Um, I think we've lost Sarah momentarily. Yes, so, uh, Sathya, would you like to... Yes, yeah, sure. Give us um, your spin. Sorry. Yeah, so I've got a bit of an interesting um, perspective on this, and I, I fully agree with all the benefits, but I guess I'm kind of on that receiving end of where I think maybe a lot of women of colour feel or anyone that kind of feels they don't fit the uh, dominant boxes of what they see in, in the workplace, which is, you know, I've got now to be at quite a senior level um, in my career, but I've never had a mentor and I've never had um, an official sponsor. Um, and actually, that's kind of what we're trying to address here, which is, you know, my whole career, I've been told that mentorship is important, sponsorship is important, and I believe it. But it, it has felt so kind of uncomfortable and awkward and not organic to find. And this is where I think role models, mentorship, sponsorship are so interrelated and which is why I wanted to have this session with Involve, which is, you know, I, I come across and I see myself as a very confident person. I always, you know, I was very lucky. I had privileges where I went to a good school. I could speak the professional lingo. I was very bright. I did well. I was confident in my abilities. I could kind of maneuver the old guys network when I encountered it. But I felt so awkward and uncomfortable trying to find a mentor, whatever that is, or, or kind of um, find a, a sponsor. I think I've had really good relationships with senior stakeholders that I have interacted with through my day job, and they have done a lot for me. But I've kind of been recently trying to unpack and think, you know, that's probably not a coincidence. Why is it that I, first of all, didn't feel that hand come towards me? Because I'm, I'm also a people's person. I, I love talking to people, learning from people. So I don't shy away from that. But why is it that mentorship and sponsorship just felt so kind of unnatural and kind of cringy for me that I didn't feel equipped 
to initiate those conversations. And I didn't feel enough of a push coming to try and pull me into those conversations. And I think this is where the point, and I think I saw a question um, come through, you know, what do we do? Yes, we have things on gender, we have things on race, but women of color are often at the bottom of both piles, right? So if you have a women's initiative, that's great. And I'm not discrediting them. There's been great stuff done, but actually we can lose the minutia of who, who tends to be the majority that benefits from these things. And I think for me, the question is, what can we all do so that I've somehow reached a point in my career where I'm now a mentor for a lot of people and I've never been mentored. Um, and I've also reached a point where I need to really check myself and say, you know, it's not too late. We all need mentors. And so I think there is there are two questions here. How do we not just rely on women of colour to mentor other women of colour? Because where there's less of us, that's a lot of burden on, on already quite an intense load on our shoulders. Um, so how do we actually get leaders to really break those circles? Kind of like Elizabeth was saying, you know, you, mentors and sponsors tend to go in similar circles. So how do we break that and, and put it on other people in the organization, not just the women of color to mentor? And how do we make it okay for women of color to think that's not just something the upstart um, kind of white guy that does really well in the organization. And, and I'm sorry, I'm being crass for a reason. It's not for them. It's it's for me. I, I should value that. I should invest the time. And if someone's not lending that hand out, I need to make the time to seek a mentor internally or externally. And I feel like I, I haven't had that. Um, and I'm only now realizing that there's probably many of women, many women of color that were in my position. Absolutely. But it's brilliant that you're now uh, mentoring <laughs> uh, uh, emerging talent as well. So Sarah, so sorry that we lost you there for, for, <laughs> for a bit of time. Hopefully you can hear me now. Yeah. Yes, we can. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, did you want to uh, perhaps finish your point on, on mentoring before we yeah. move on? Yeah, we probably drifted from what the point I was going to make, but I think, you know, just listening to Safia and the fact that she talked about not having mentors throughout her career, um, you know, I've been very different. I have had mentors, but none that have looked like me at all. You know, I've always been in an environment where everyone around me is white, predominantly white men. Um, and I've had to seek mentorship from people that I know don't understand me, don't necessarily understand the individual challenges that I'm facing. Um, but I still manage to take what I can from it. You know, sometimes the guidance and the advice you get isn't necessarily um, reflective of you know who you are as a woman of color. Well, sometimes when you're given advice from a, a white male who will say this is how to approach a certain situation, and I'm like, mm, I can't, I can't approach it in the way that you would, and they would not necessarily understand that you know the way that they can just push their way into a room and say and demand what they want is not something that would go down very well. You know, I'll probably be kind of. Uh, labeled as the angry black woman so you know you've got to really think about that but um I would having said that I think the power of having a mentor that does look like you that does understand you and that does nest or that does you know get to where you're coming from you know is should not be underestimated and there isn't enough and so you know for women of color if you are within business and it's really nice to hear Safia talking about being a mentor to so many others and I do the same but it's making sure that, you know, you kind of lift as you climb, you know, once you're up there looking down and seeing how, how can you can support others um, rather than just kind of getting your head down and saying, I'm OK. What can you do to give back to others? Because, yes, you can get mentorship from others, um, you know, for white people, from white men. They just may not necessarily get you and be able to give you the targeted advice in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. It's not obviously they don't have the, the, the same perspective. So it's very hard to kind of like in, engage in that way. But thank you. Thank you all for sharing your, your experiences uh, in terms of mentorship. So there's, there's this notion that you, you can't be what you can't see. Uh, and obviously, we, we've, we have really uh, tried very hard with, with our role modeling lists and power, outstanding, and heroes to really uh, promote role models in business so that actually people 
can see that uh, you know, diversity is not going to stop them from actually reaching those senior leadership roles. So we want to inspire them. But um, women of color often don't have, as we mentioned, visible role models uh, in those positions that they can aspire to, uh, to reach professionally. So how has the, the lack of visible role models impacted your own career? So I'll, I'll start. Um, just, you know, I have benefited from having mentors and sponsors throughout my career. Um, I've had strong female role models, um, you know, who certainly led by example, but also men who were allies. So I think it took time. Um, and I say that that's where mentoring is two ways. So sometimes it was really trying to explain my perspective and what I faced, how it may be different from the white male. Um, but clearly there weren't as many diverse leaders and senior roles that I aspired to reach. And, you know, for me, I felt it was really important to get involved with employee resource groups like women's networks and Latinx leadership forums, because through my participation in, in those groups, you know, I met a whole new set of leaders who had much more similar backgrounds and shared experiences and, and certainly some of the same career challenges and struggles that I might face. You know, and I also looked at it as, you know, another way to network with colleagues outside of my function. You know, I might not have, you know, otherwise come into contact with in my day-to-day -day role, um, you know, with eventually, you know, developing these relationships with senior leaders, um, you know, that I could reach out to and lean on for advice and mentorship and, you know, even developing sponsorship, you know, along the way. Um, you know, but the other thing was, you know, I realized how important these employee resource groups were to giving me opportunities for external networking and access to organizations and industry groups, you know, so that there is that thought leadership exchange and best practice sharing, you know, for opportunities, just like today's panel discussion. I think, you know, getting to work with other leaders that, you know, are committed to doing the exact same activities, right? Attracting, retaining, developing, you know, serving the communities where we live and work. So, you know, and, and then the other thing that I would just share is, you know, as a working mother, you know, I want to be a role model to my children and certainly, you know, have had to navigate through challenges of work-life balance and, you know, fighting to have a seat at the table, making sure I have a voice for myself and others. And, you know, I look at it, it it's more than just about doing my job well and growing, but, you know, how do I make a difference and help others? Um, so that's like the mother in me. I'm always so proud of my team when, you know, someone accomplishes something or someone moves on to a bigger and better role. Um, you know, I feel like that's my way in trying to help develop their careers and help, you know, I, I can influence and shape the culture within our organization and, and drive some of our diversity, you know, and inclusion agenda as, you know, an ambassador. So for me, you know, I feel a real sense of obligation to kind of pay it forward and pave that road for others because I've really, you know, been the recipient of great mentorship and sponsorship. That's so, that's absolutely brilliant. Th thanks, Elizabeth. How about you, Safia? Yeah, so I would actually say um, for me, you know, with role models, I think you're right. You know, there aren't that many people and I would say in any space. So, um, you know, what I love to do is actually talk just outside, you know, not just within the professional circles, but outside. Um, but in My Skin, My Story, we've, we've talked about the term unicorn and how sometimes you can kind of just feel like a unicorn, like either because of the field you're in or the level of seniority, or actually chances are just probability in terms of where, where we are today as a society is you will be the one or one of the few women of color, perhaps on your floor, in your team, in your department. So I think for us, it's about being creative with our role models, because actually they are not as conveniently placed as if you weren't a woman of color. And so this is where I really believe that you kind of have to build your own community, because I also am a big believer that role models don't have to be more senior than you. I think for me, so I love um, the arts. So in another life in my brain, I'm like a singer and a dancer, but I was never quite good enough. Um, and, and what I've always learned, because I do a lot of dancing is in the dance world, there are no concerns about going to a dance class where the teacher is like 10 years younger than you, which I've, I've done more than once. It's because they're talented 
and you know that you can learn from them. And there is this, I think we're quite limited in terms of what we think a role model is. We're kind of feeding into these old thoughts of it has to be a senior person of a certain level in the corporate world doing just what you do. Um, and I actually think it's creating spaces, uh, finding those role models wherever they are. It takes more effort because they aren't right on my lap. You know, they don't just fall from trees, unfortunately, if you're looking for role models that look like you. But I've actually found something kind of more deep and inspirational when you when you actually hear from entrepreneurs, from community builders, from artists, and you're like, actually, a woman of color in any of these places is dealing with the same things. And actually, in some areas, they've figured things out that we haven't yet in the corporate world. And that can be super helpful. So I think for me, yes, I've had role models. Um, I've, but they've not been necessarily leaders in, in a corporate sense. Um, and I think that's important. And until we catch up so that there are many women that look like us um, that are heading up, you know, all the organizations, so it's not so hard. Um, I think it's really important to get that inspiration where we can, and you don't always have to look up. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's brilliant, uh, actually, uh, insight as well in terms of the role models don't necessarily have to be uh, senior execs or, or really senior senior leaders in, in business or outside of business even, as you said. Intersectionality is so important, but also there are superstars at very junior levels and at all levels. So uh, engaging with as many people as possible is, is truly, truly valuable. So how about you, Sarah? Would you, would you what would, is your take actually on, on role mod models and their impact? Yeah, I've been violently nodding my head as Safia and Elizabeth were <laughs> talking, but I love what Safia talked about in terms of um, being more creative with your role models. So, you know, the work that Involve does is great in terms of the, you know, the power lists and the executive lists. They're fantastic because it shows you in the business world what's out there and what can be done. And that may not necessarily be within your internal environment. However, for me, you know, I've already spoke to the fact that I've looked up and there isn't anyone that looks like me. I was the first black female senior manager in a FTSE 100 business that's been around for 150 years. So, you know, if I'm waiting for somebody that looks like me to be inspired, I'm well, I would have been waiting for a long time. So for me, you know, a key role, role model has been, for example, my mother. You know, she came to this country in the early 70s from Nigeria with nothing and has been as fierce as anything in terms of this is what I want, this is what I want to deliver. You know, she's a single parent. And actually so many of you will have similar stories, especially when you've got parents that have come, um, you know, over to this country um, and you may be first generation or second generation, you know, immigrants. So, and the stories and the, the strength that comes from that, is so powerful and you think you know what if I can get through that if, if if we can you know overcome those obstacles that come with you know starting you know and establishing yourself in a, in a new country and you know progressing your career in a new you know in a new environment um, then you can do so much more and so it's, it's being more creative and actually looking closer to home in terms of you know what are the stories around me within my community you know one of my role models is, is my daughter you know, she's amazing. I look at her and I'm so inspired. Um, and so, you know, create, create your own role models, I say, and, you know, don't always wait for someone. And actually, if there is nobody that looks like you, use that as motivation to say, you know what, I'm going to be the first. I'm going to do this and use your network to get there. That is some brilliant uh, piece of advice. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. And actually, it goes very well with our next question, which is, what is the one piece of advice you would give to women uh, who look to you for career guidance and inspiration? Um. I'll jump in. I think okay. don't do it alone because something that, and again, I think we all, one message I want everyone to take away is when we talk about women of colour, we all have very individual experiences. So I'm talking to mine and the conversations that have come from me speaking to other women of colour but I think there are many of us who there's so much going on. We are often dealing with overt or implicit, just uncomfortable situations in a world that's not built for us. Some of it can be 
um, you know, around race, some of it can be around gender, some of it can just be like not fitting the box. So I think we are often conditioned to just like put our head down and just like get through it, be fabulous, be that overachiever. I think I saw in one of the questions, like work two times as hard, three times as hard, 10 times as hard. And just, and then we magically believe that the world is fair and that that'll be fine. And our, our shining light will be rewarded and, and we'll make it through. And I think there is so much around, we want to get to a point where we don't have to work two times as hard, um, but there will be a time where we do. So find your community, you know, speak to each other, find those trusted people. They can look like you, they don't have to look like you. But I found only, you know, in my 30s that I'm starting to have these real conversations with other women of colour and I get so much validation, so much nourishment, but also like amazing advice to Sarah's point before, because these are women of colour who know what I'm talking about when I say that this has happened and I either feel like I can't do what, say, a white man can do because it, it's perceived differently in, in, my, in my skin. Um, so yeah, that would be my thing. I think we really need to just snap ourselves out of it. We, we have a bit of this assimilation theory where we don't want to congregate, we kind of stick to our own corners, but we really need to fight against that within our organizations and our, outside of it. Find your people uh, and, and don't be afraid to ask for that help um, because yeah, too much, we're just trying to, we think, you know, I'll just work hard, the fortitude, grin and bear it, I'll survive, it'll be better in the long run, but we don't need to be martyrs. And I think that's really important. I'm off my soapbox now, sorry. <laughs> you know, so, so I'll say uh, mine definitely ties into some of the themes that you said. So get involved, right? Raise your hand, look for stretch opportunities. Uh, you want to grow and you know you can demonstrate your leadership and your skills but you can also build new ones and grow that way as well I, I just i think it's so important i think that a lot of times i notice that people aren't applying for that next job because they feel like well i haven't done this well guess what men have no problem you know not having done something and then applying for a job saying that they're qualified for it so i think it's really important that we we just learn to put our hands up and to say i'm ready for the challenge if there isn't learning with it then it's not a challenge and we're not growing i also think that we do need to be intentional about development opportunities we need to kind of put that mirror in front of us and really you know understand where are those areas for development who do we reach out to you know, so whether it's, you know, people that we trust, whether it's official mentors, you know, sponsors, but let's look for people who are good in those areas that we want to develop and, you know, we can learn and grow from that. Um, the other thing, you know, I say is as you work with mentors, you need to be open to feedback and ask others about your blind spots, because often we might be working on something, but we're not paying attention to something that would really move that needle. Um, and then I think, you know, have that accountability where let others know what you're working on so that they can tell you how you're doing. And, and, and just, I always like to give like very practical advice, things that you can like walk away with and do. And I remember that I was part of a, a leadership development program and they asked us to, during the session, reach out to 10 people who knew us well and ask what three qualities described us, what three qualities. And you can reach out to your coworkers, you can reach out to your, your significant others, spouses, relatives, friends. And what's really important is they, they had us put it in one of those like word clouds to see which words kept coming up. And the important thing is the words that came out the most are those the words that you want people to think of when they think of you. And if not, what do you need to do to change those behaviors? So I thought it was, you know, a really, really helpful exercise. And, you know, I had words like empathetic and, you know, um, uh, direct, which I know that I'm, I'm very, very direct, but, you know, being empathetic in a way that I look at each, you know, individual situation. So I just think it's really important for our own development to make sure that, you know, again, we're being very conscious of where do we have room to grow? What is it that we want to focus on? And then make, holding ourselves accountable um, to have others tell us if they think that we're doing that. 
Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Sarah? Do you, do you have any other piece of advice that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think mine builds on both Safia and Elizabeth's point, you know, the, the point Safia made around, you know, we are built with this um, belief that we need to work harder and faster than everybody else in order to just kind of be treated, you know, be on a level playing field. Um, and I was certainly, I certainly had that drummed into me as a, as a young child. Um, but the more senior I've got and the more I progressed through my career, I realized that what got me here is not what's going to get me there. And you do need to change. Working hard looks different at different levels. So that kind of get your head down, just keep getting my head down and just working hard and hopefully someone will notice me only gets you to a certain, certain point you then have to switch into my hard work looks very different. It is actually the development that Elizabeth just talked about. It's then reaching out, finding your, you know, who are your sponsors, who are your networks, look at your development plan, understand your blind spots. And the more you focus on that, that's what's gonna get you to the next level. And the more you socialize what you're working on and where you want to go, although it feels very unnatural and very uncomfortable because I know I wasn't built in that way to say, right, you know, tell everybody I want to be the next CEO and, you know, you know, give me a meeting with, you know, the CFO, just, you know, that just doesn't come natural to many of us. But, you know, unfortunately, it is something that we have to learn to do and develop ourselves to think about, you know, just don't have to apologize about, you know, being ambitious and wanting to, to be the best version of yourself and wanting to actually progress your career. So it's just thinking about, yes, work hard, but it's actually work, hard work looks different. Find a way to make that transition from the doing to focusing on, on you and your own development. That's some really solid advice. Thank you to, to the three of you uh, for, for sharing that with us. Incredibly inspiring. Um, so in terms of actually inspiration as well, we've just closed nominations for our empower lists uh, of ethnically diverse role models in business. So what about you? Who would be your number one role model? And it doesn't have to be in business. Mine's not. Um, I, I love Alicia Keys. I just have to say, and I think she's a great example of what does success look like for you? Because I think often we're striving for a picture of what a leader looks like, which maybe they have bravado, maybe they're an extrovert, maybe they are an older white male so they can say things that you can't. And what I love with her is I feel like she's one of these people that no one argues that she's awesome. Like, and it's very hard to find those people, but she has a strength, but she also has this ability to heal and to be empathetic. And I don't think anyone sees that as a weakness in her. And I think sometimes we think at work, we've been drilled this message that those, those qualities are not valued. So I just love her because I think she makes things better. I think she's also got a wisdom beyond her years. So back to that point of, I think people thought she was awesome when she was 20, you know, and it's back to this um, thing I have, which I hate that you have to be a certain age to be successful. So I think for me, um, yeah, she's got that feminine power and she's unapologetic about it and no one questions the strength behind it. Yeah, and she de defined uh, success in her own terms as well. Um, she's brilliant. All right, any other uh, role models, Sarah and Elizabeth? So, you know, uh, I, when I thought about this question, I was actually thinking about, you know, within my own organization, who I go to um, as a role model. And, you know, there's a colleague of mine who comes to mind who actually um, was a, a past or fellow Empower role model. And, you know, I think of her because, you know, she recently was named to co-chair our IMPACT, which is our multicultural uh, employee resource group, Global. She has been the co-chair for the Black Leadership Forum and was appointed, you know, to serve in a diversity and inclusion advocate capacity. You know, she does that, you know, and I always say we do this job off the side of our desk because we all have day jobs. And, you know, her day job, she's a managing director, senior counsel for Pershing Legal. That's a really big job. But, you know, I think about, you know, she and I really got to know each other through our work on impact. And it's that connection. We've built a relationship with over time. You know, I, I 
consider her part of my personal board of directors. And you know, she's a go-to person, you know, that, that can help me see things from a different lens. And, you know, someone who that we've had very candid and honest conversations with all going on. And, you know, I feel like, you know, we've partnered together to deliver programs, but you know, she's someone that now I could go to. And, you know, and I'm I'm truly grateful for, you know, her friendship and, and partnership over the years. So, you know, I look at that and then, you know, her name is Tanya Bottoms, which I don't think that I mentioned, but, um, you know, again, I, I think it's those types of relationships. It's so great to see someone in the organization, you know, that kind of, you know, has that same passion for helping to drive the change. Um, and it's great that I can just pick up the phone or I can link her a message and, you know, she and I can touch base pretty regularly. So it, it's, it's those awesome. types of um, role models that, you know, I'm truly grateful for in business now. Thanks. That's really awesome. Thanks, Elizabeth. How about you, Sarah? Yeah, so I think I touched on mine earlier um, when we talked about being creative with our, with our role models. And um, I talked about my mother and the role that she's played in my life. And so I think she's been the biggest role model for me in terms of demonstrating what can be achieved, you know, with, you know, that determination, that belief in yourself. As I said, she came here um, as a 19 year old and you know as a single mother with three three kids um, you know managed to you know work her way to achieve her dreams as a, as a senior lecturer and a business advisor um, in academia as well and um, she's done so much and I look at her and think wow you know you know the what is possible um, most people don't actually realize their their capacity to to achieve and do more and actually living the life that I have done with my mum and seeing her come from nothing to where she got us all to um, has made me believe in myself and believe in others as well and the potential in others. Um, and so I like to bring that out, out in my teams as well so that they can see what they're capable of because you know people are capable of great things. Um, and I'm lucky to have worked with so many great role models at work even today many of them don't look like me at all but um, they've inspired me in lots of different ways so um yeah i try again as to Safi's point try to be as creative with my role models as i can and um yeah find inspiration from many different examples and your daughter as well that you mentioned earlier <laughs> yeah she's amazing she's absolutely amazing so my daughter she's 20 she's gonna be 21 um in june no um, one can believe it sarah it oh, yeah. <laughs> say that gets me every time she, yeah she I, I i started early but i am hiding the grades and you can't see that so um, i'm older than i look but um i brought her up to just believe that she can be do have anything that she dreams to to be and um you know she doesn't doubt herself you know she's really amb ambitious in terms of what she wants to do with herself and um she's at uni at the moment um but i look at her and i i think you know what i wish i was like that when i was when I was her age and I um I worry about when she goes into the work environment you know because you know if anyone gets in her way I think uh, <laughs> there's going to be <laughs> some interesting conversations but um but yeah my, my daughter's yeah definitely my number one too yeah, that's that's uh, absolutely so inspiring but honestly I thought when you, you were talking about your daughter I pictured like perhaps a, like a five or ten year old oh, Max no. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Um, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so the next question uh, that I'm going to ask you is, is really about um, kind of like the burden of education. It, it really shouldn't always lie on, on diverse uh, communities or, or what people refer to the minority groups. Um, what would be kind of like the practical ways that uh, you'd like people like me, allies and colleagues, to truly advocate for you and ensure that, that you're valued and heard within uh, organizations. Safia, would you like to, to start? Yeah, sure. I think this is a challenge we're all faced with. Um, if I'm being really honest, I don't know if we have the answers. I mean, just to give you a, an example that's really um, current right now and applies to everyone, no matter where you've dialed in from, um, International Women's Day, is great. I love it. I love, you know, Women's History Month. It, it's great that we're having, having that. Um, I understand that we want to spotlight and support women, but you know what? All the women I know, we have had a hellish couple of weeks because a, a lot of 
the organizing, pulling it together has fallen on women or, or women of color. Um, and this is on top of us doing the extra work of DNI because it's become a hot topic. And uh, and really, I think it's um, there's two things, and and I'm learning this myself. I need to figure out how to um, create boundaries, which I think you know when you feel like you can make a real impact, you kind of self sacrifice all along the way because you're like. I'm exhausted, I'm a bit overwhelmed, but I know I can have a huge impact and I'm not sure it'll happen if I don't do it. And I think it's that sentiment that needs to change. If, if we think that it'll fall apart if we don't do it, that, that shows that lack of allyship that's active. Um, and I, I really don't know the answer, but I, I had a flippant comment with a friend when um, me and a friend of mine who, who works at Google were commiserating and I was like, how about like next year we all just decide, I don't know how serious I am about this, that just all the International Women's Day events are organized by men. We tell them what we want. We'll rock up and do the speaking, but I don't want to be doing all of the organizing, communicating, making a buzz about it. So I, so I think it's actually being explicit and actually having conversations like this around who's doing the work. And if it all looks like the people who are most impacted by what has previously been unfair, let's actually take that to our leaders and say, we need to even out the resourcing on this. But, but I'll be honest, I don't know. And, and I have heard it, I've felt it myself. I've heard it from my own friends. I mean, Black History Month, same thing going on with my Black friends. It is a drain. It's a lot. And we're not quite sure. So I think it's actually how do we really sound without sounding dramatic sound the alarm because it can get really intense really quickly especially when there's so much happening in our communities in the news um, but I'm not sure I have the answer that's a thank you for your your honesty and and giving yeah that that really honest answer because obviously it's it's hard it's it's just so many uh conversations happening uh, around diversity and also uh these dates just make it even like more pressure on people to actually put together events, conversations, panel discussions. So I appreciate you actually uh, giving that insight. Uh, Sarah, did, did you want to share any um, of your insights as well? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything Safi has just said. I, don't, I just don't know if there is an answer to it and it's something that we need to get around. But my honest opinion is I just don't think we're there yet to be able to remove the education from from ourselves and especially when it comes to the you know from an ethnically diverse perspective if I think about everything that we had to go through around Black Lives Matter I know that the business would not have been able to get through and respond and coach and reply in the way that we have done without the education from myself and you know black colleagues within our network and without the navigation of us and it, it was very difficult because on one hand you're going through the pain and you're tired and you're you know you're you're grieving to a degree as well you know and you're trying to process your own emotions and then to have to educate and have that burden of feeling as though I need to it's on me and actually to Safi's point if I don't do it is it going to happen or is it going to be done as effectively? You know, I, I'm not sure. And, um, you know, it's, it's a tough place to be where you feel as though it's on you and we need to progress for me is, is, is moving away from, from that place. And we're not, we're not there yet. And yeah, again, I don't know if I have the answer, but I think the more allies we have, the more you know, education that there is out there and, and the more we can encourage business leaders and peers to self-educate as well. You know, it's all out there. You know, the more asking ethnically diverse colleagues to regurgitate stories, which are often quite emotional, which are often quite stressful each time we're trying to, you know, is, is, is quite a lot and it's emotionally draining and does have an impact on, you know, how you perform on a day-to-day -day basis. Because for many, this isn't your day job. This is something that you do over and above your day job. And it's how you protect your energy to make sure that, you know, you can continue to function 
you know, you know, within your role as a mother, as a friend, as a, you know, we, we have so many different roles that we play. Um, and this part that we, we play in terms of education can be quite, um, quite significantly burdening in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. And, and organizations sh really shouldn't just um, put the responsibility, responsibility, the sole responsibility on educating and raising awareness on their diverse talent. Like it's mm. just uh, absolutely counterproductive and uh, partnering with external organizations helps kind of like uh, get more allies, getting those conversations started at the executive level with people who actually have the experience of having them and who actually also kind of like um, can compare and can give examples and share best practice from other organizations because no one is getting everything right uh, on all, all fronts. So diversity and inclusion is really about kind of like sharing these experiences and making sure that, that uh, different companies in different industries can actually learn from each other as well. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So uh, talking about, I mean, we're coming to, to almost the end. I do have one last question. So women of color are um, one of the most under, underrepresented groups uh, across uh, society, as we know. But like from looking at it from like that business perspective, what would you say are, are some things, for example, that your organizations are doing or that you have done to actually elevate this group? Elizabeth, would you like to start with us? Sure, happy to. So, you know, uh, certainly one way is to focus on having programs to advance diverse talent. So, you know, in my role, I co-chair the Latinx Leadership Forum for BMY Mellon. And this year we introduced two new professional development opportunities through a, a, you know, a new partner relationship with an organization. It's called the Hispanic Alliance for Career Advancement. And What's interesting is, and I think this touches on one of the points that was raised earlier, there's two programs. One is like the Emerging Latinx Leadership Program, but the other one is a women's leadership program, very specific. Um, so they call it the Mujeres de Ace, Women of Ace. And you know that program is going to focus on things that are very unique to women, right? And this is Latinx women. So you know, this is our kind of inaugural cohort. We're putting them through. They'll be working with other, you know, um, organizations that have, you know, put their high potential professionals because we know that, you know, this program, that this is a community where there's, you know, it's rapidly growing. It's a powerful segment of our workforce, our economy. We need to make sure that we're investing in this, you know, and we have to be intentional about, you know, supporting this untapped employee population, you know, and build that talent community. So, you know, I think we, we have to continue to look for opportunities. How do we develop and lift that next generation of leaders being very deliberate you know, about giving them the right exposure to senior leaders, you know, so that we're building that bench and that succession planning. So as part of this, you know, we're looking to make sure that we're assigning mentors to the people that we're putting through the program. So they have other people, you know, within their community that they can hopefully discuss things as they bring it back to work. So we're very excited about that opportunity. That's very exciting. Yeah. How, how about you, Satya and Sarah? Do you have any <clears throat> initiatives you'd like to share? I know we're running a little bit over time, but hopefully we can stay online for a couple more minutes. Go ahead, Sarah. I talk too much. Go on. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute. <laughs> I never do that. <laughs> um, similar to what Elizabeth has just described, I think for us it's being able to recognise that we are not going to be able to tackle this underrepresentation without consciously making, um, you know, taking, putting steps and programs in place to be able to address it. So that's something that, you know, our business has done extremely well in terms of recognizing that um, and putting into place um, specific development programs um, for our ethnically diverse talent, but then also thinking more specifically around sponsorship and making sure that, you know, we have assigned sponsors um, all the way from board level um, to make sure that you know we are intentionally helping to open doors and um, bring top talent um, from an ethnically diverse mm. background through the business um, and that's something that we've been doing um, really 
you know, considerately on making sure that we are focused and there's a targeted approach with that. Um, and our, our operating board uh, have really been focusing on making sure that we can track our progress with that as well. And um, one of the things that we came out with, I think back in um, after Black Lives Matter was specific targets as well, not specifically for women, but for um, our ethnically diverse groups. So thinking about not necessarily using that kind of the umbrella of fame anymore, but actually saying, right, OK, we're going to have a black specific target and we'll look at that. We're going to have our Asian specific target and breaking it down to say, right, how do we make sure that we don't miss groups of people and actually then breaking it down further so we understand what that looks like for black women what does that look like for asian women what does that look like for asian men and actually making sure that we're looking at our data a bit better to measure progress and that's something we're doing really intentionally at the moment and I'll jump on that because you said the magic word data and that's my day job um, I would say actually all of us have a role um, companies are talking about DNI a lot we need to strike while the iron's hot and you don't have to be a woman of color. I think when, when we start to see that there are women's initiatives or initiatives on race, ask, are we looking at it intersectionally? If they say X number of women, this has happened, ask, what is that for women of color? When they say our Bain network has done this, ask, what does that mean for black women? The more we actually have to provide that groundswell of pressure on leadership um, to keep this going. Um, and we need to question everything um, because that intersectional lens is something that organizations across the board struggle with. Um, and I think it's also listening to the young people. So how do we make sure that the young people coming up who are way more woke, open-hearted, open-minded than us, how do we make sure they don't feel they need to conform to these old systems that then kind of undo all the great work of them when they come in and they become completely kind of um, desensitized and feel they have to play by these old games. So I think it's really important that for young talent um, that, that, that we do have this kind of organized mentoring schemes because unfortunately they do not organically happen. If you wait for it to organically happen, it's people within the same circles and it perpetuates that challenge. So I think, you know, make sure you ask those questions. You don't have to have DNI in your job title. You don't need to be in any employee resource group. Start asking those questions. When we start to report on progress, where's that intersectional lens? Um, and then it'll it'll start to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you, thank you uh, to the to the three of you uh, for for joining today. It was such an incredibly uh, interesting conversation, and I wish we, it could go on and on and on, but. Um, uh, obviously, we're running out of time now. So, if um, if you're happy, uh, we'll we'll conclude here. If you have any um, we, final comments that you'd like to make, sorry, can yeah. we do a, yeah, of a course. plug, a shameless plug. So, I think um, I think Nay has just shared in the chat that if you want to follow my skin, my story, we are fully kind of virtual community, um, open to women of color if you identify as one and also open to allies and we have a meetup coming up next Tuesday um, pick your social of choice on LinkedIn and also on Instagram my skin my story underscore and it's really about the work we're doing in organizations but also in communities how do we share stories how do we actually shine a light spotlight and amplify women of color and I think some of that can be done at work but some of that is through societal change. You know, the more we get out there, the more we share our experiences, the more that we'll come out of the margins and, and into the kind of stage and have that spotlight we deserve. Thanks. Thanks, Safia. And we'll make sure we share that in, in the follow-up email as well kind of with, the, with the link to, the, to this video. So any final words, Elizabeth and Sarah? Thank you. <laughs> enjoyable session, really. Thank you for including me. Appreciate oh, it. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, same. It's been a, a fantastic conversation, really powerful, really thought provoking as well. So, um, yeah, it's been a great discussion. Thank you for inviting me. Amazing. It was amazing having you uh, in this discussion. So thank you so much and, and really enjoy your evenings and take care. <laughs>